Waterbrook Church. My name is Christine Odera and I'd like to invite you to join with us as we celebrate uh, going into the house of the Lord this morning. The writer in uh, Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I do pray that this can be your testimony today as we join together um, in praising and worshiping the Lord today. These are unusual times that we are living in. Um, you know, not, not like we've ever experienced before, many of us for sure. And I'd like to invite you to choose the Lord as your dwelling place today, completely hidden in Him and trusting Him. I'd like to invite us um, to have a time of prayer before we go into the service. And I'd like to invite us to pray according to the Psalm 91. Um, Psalm 91 says, he, well, begins by saying, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest on the shadow of the Almighty. Will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So let us pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word that says that we can actually rest in your shadow. We will be in a safe place when we do this. We will be hidden from the fowler's snare and away from the deadly pestilence. Father, we, we know that if we are in, a, in this safe place, we will be cov covered by your feathers. We will be hidden under your wings. We will find refuge in that place and because you are faithful and you are our shield. Father, we thank you that we will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that draws, destroys at midday. A thousand may fall, at our side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near us. This is what your word says. So Father, we thank you today that we are hidden in you and that we, we are safe in you. Father, we come to praise you and to worship you and to give you a thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd like to invite you to, into a, um, a time of praise and worship. Do join us and the worship team as we go into this time. Ooh. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we glorify you and we lift you up. Serving you, O oh Lord, is a privilege. I'm gonna lift you up. We glorify you. Lord, we glorify you. And we lift you up. You alone. Serving you, O oh Lord, is a privilege. I'm gonna lift you up. From the rising of the sun. I'm gonna lift you up. To the going down of the sea. I'm gonna lift you up. I'll praise you all my day. I'm gonna lift you up. I'll give you all my praise. I'm gonna lift you up. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we glorify you. And we lift you up. Serving you, O oh Lord. Serving you, O oh Lord, is a privilege. I'm gonna lift you up. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we glorify you. And we lift you up. Serving you, O oh Lord. Serving you, O oh Lord, is a privilege. I'm gonna lift you up. Sing glory. Glory, honor, mighty power. Worthy Jesus, I'm gonna lift you up one more say glory, honor, mighty power, worthy Jesus, I'm gonna lift you up glory, honor, mighty power, worthy Jesus, I'm gonna lift you up one more time glory, honor, mighty power. Worthy Jesus, I'm gonna lift you up, take it up and glory, honor, mighty power, worthy Jesus, I'm gonna lift you up, glory, 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 honor, mighty power, worthy Jesus, I'm gonna lift you up, I'm gonna lift, I'm gonna lift you up, I'm gonna lift, I'm gonna lift you up. Uh, we come back to Africa with this one. Wahamba natia, oh wahamba natia, 
Oh, I'm an auntie. See, I won't go. You sing, you sing. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, I'm an auntie. See, I won't go. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, I'm an auntie. See, I won't go. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, I'm an auntie. Oh, a hamanati. Oh, a hamanati. Siya bonga. Siya bonga. Siya bonga, Jesu. Siya bonga, Gonyama Ezulu. Siya bonga, Jesu. Siya bonga. Siya bonga, Jesu. Siya bonga, Jesu. Siya bonga, Gonyama Ezulu. Siya bonga, Jesu. Siya bonga. Tembe. Tembe anasi, oh tembe anasi, oh tembe anasi, tuashukuru. Tembe anasi, tembe anasi, oh tembe anasi, oh tembe anasi, tuashukuru. Tuashukuru, tuashukuru Yesu, tuashukuru Simba wa Yula, tuashukuru Yesu, tuashukuru. Tuashukuru Yesu Tuashukuru Simba wa Yula Tuashukuru Yesu Tuashukuru Here we go Say hey Because you made Now we're standing here 
only because you made a way You made a way You sing, you made You made a way You made a way You made You made a way You made You made a way Your love is kind Your love is patient You fill my life With so much peace and joy You're Make my life feel brand new You're amazing You make my life feel brand new Sing Jesus you love me too much oh. Too much oh Too much oh Excess love oh. Jesus, you love me too much, oh, too much, oh, too much, oh, excess love, oh. Jesus, you love me too much, oh, too much, oh, too much, oh, excess love, oh. Jesus, you love me too much, oh. Too much, oh, too much, oh, excess love. Oh. Your love is kind. Your love is patient. You feel my heart yeah, with so much peace.
Father, you love us so much, and so we take this time to just give you glory and say you love us too much. May your love just continue to flow in us, through us, go before us. As we go into this next segment, we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. In, the times, in these times that we are not meeting together as a body, we want to invite you to join us online on all of our platforms, uh, to tune in for Sunday services, even during the week, to join us for prayer meeting, which is, on, uh, which is every Friday at 7 p.m. Join us on Mixler, on YouTube, on Instagram, and on Facebook Live. It'll be a pleasure to have you. Did any one of you have a, a celebration this week, or are you celebrating a birthday? Anyone celebrating an anniversary? Any important event? These, while these are unusual times, um, we do invite you and encourage you still to see life for what it is. See life from the bright side. We encourage you to let us know if it was your birthday, if it was an important event in your life, um, so that we may celebrate with you and thank God together with you. Happy birthday if it was your birthday this week. It is time to give. First of all, I want to thank you so much for all the giving that you've been able to do in, in recent times. Um, I invite us to give uh, today using the platforms that will be scrolling at the bottom of your screen, either through bank or through pay bill number. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for all that you've uh, provided to us by way of resources. We thank you, Father God, that, that we can give this back to you in worship and in, in, in gratitude for all that you do for us. We want to pray, Lord God, for each one who is giving, that you would add to their, their, their pockets as well as they continue. And for pray further for those who may not be able to give, that you would give to them that which they can give back to you. And so we're just grateful for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are at that point in the service where it is now time to receive um, the Word of God. Um, we would like to invite Pastor Steve Koine to share with us the Word as he has received it from the Lord. Welcome Pastor Steve. Good morning, good morning, good morning church from wherever you are watching us from. Today is a good day. We are glad, we are rejoicing that the Lord has kept us and I believe that God has kept you too. Uh, this is another uh, moment where we are going to receive the word of God and I am so so glad that today God has prepared a word for you there is something that God is going to speak to you and I believe there is something that God is doing in your life and I also believe that um, despite everything that is happening in your life I am sure that God has a good plan for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you an expected end. And so I want you to just sit back, relax, and know that God is in control. Uh, before I begin, why don't we just begin with a word of prayer right now? Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are an awesome God. You're a good God. You've kept us, you've sustained us, and we are so blessed today. We are so blessed to hear your word. We are blessed because we are alive. We thank you, Father, because in you we live and breathe and have our being. There is no other God like you. You are the supreme God. You are omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing, and Father of God. And so today we just want to give you praise. We want to exalt you. We want to thank you because you've kept us. We want to just... Uh, release our hearts to you this moment even as we listen to your word today and we also want to know that father even as your word comes forth father it's going to change our lives it's going to change and transform our minds and make us better people so that we can be able to serve you to move into the areas that you have called us and to do the things that you've called us to do father i pray for everyone that is watching us today that even as the word comes forth lord may eat oh god uh, touch your people. May it shift somebody's lifestyle. May it just transform somebody's mind. May it heal, Father. May it restore someone to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. 
What a wonderful day this is today and I want to share with you a very critical message or a very, very um, important message. This message has the potential to change your life. This message has the potential to shift you from where you are to the place that God wants you to be. And so I want you to just listen. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to just take some notes. If you can get a book, call some friends of yours and just uh, sit down and relax and let us hear what the word of God uh, has for us today. I want to be sharing with you something I'm calling moving to the new, moving to the new. And this is something that I'm hoping and trusting God that is going to shift your perspective. It's going to shift your life. It's going to shift you from where you are. And I believe that this is just not an, uh, a simple word, especially considering the times that we are living in. These are interesting times. These are times that we've never seen before. But I believe in everything that is happening, God is in control. So we don't need to fear. Now, God is always moving. God is always moving. He has never been stagnant at any point in life. If you read the Bible from Genesis to Exodus, uh, all the way to the Revelation, God has always been moving. He has never remained stagnant. Uh, there's no time in history where God has remained in the same spot. You know, his attributes uh, don't change. He's a loving God. He will always be loving. Uh, he is the creator. He is deliverer. He is a promise keeper. He is our healer. And those are things, those are characteristics of God that will never change. But sometimes his ways change. Sometimes the way he does things uh, changes. The way he, he will do something today is not the way he's going to do it tomorrow. Uh, there are several stories. I could go uh, from one story to another story, but I don't have the time for that. But what I really want to, to uh, emphasize is that his attributes don't change. God will never cease to be a loving God. He will never cease to be our deliverer. He'll never cease to be our healer. He will never uh, uh, go back on his promises. You know, men can promise you something and sometimes they don't fulfill it. But God is a promise keeper and that will never change about him. That is his characteristic. He's your healer. He's your deliverer. That will never change. But the way he does things sometimes, especially in relation to our lives, is different. Because the Bible says that his ways, sometimes people say his ways don't change, but actually what doesn't change about God is his characteristics. His characteristics is always remain a loving God, period. But the Bible says that God always does new things. It's like God loves to do new things. And God always showers us with new seasons. Doesn't the Bible say that, behold, I'm now doing a new thing. Can't you see it? Can't you see it? He's doing a new thing. So every time God wants to do something new, he has to disrupt the old one first. And that got me by surprise because many times in my life, when I was experiencing and expecting that God is doing something, I always had this idea in my mind that probably God will do it the same way he did it yesterday or the same way. You know, we always like to say God is the same today, yesterday and forever, which is true in, in, in relation to his attributes. But every time that God wants to do something new, he has to disrupt the old one first. He has to disrupt some things. And I want to submit to you today that God, despite what is going on in the country or in the world right now, I personally believe that God is doing something new. There is something that God wants to usher into the world. There is something that God wants to introduce. There is something that God wants to bring. I may not be able to pinpoint accurately what it is, but considering everything that is happening with all the shadow and everything, and this message is not about coronavirus. It's not about uh, people have been so focused about trying to, to, tell, to, to just speak their minds out and come with all these uh, theories and ideas. This is not just about that. This is about God doing something new in your life. It's about God taking you to the promised land. It's about God ushering you into a new place. But before God ushers you into a new place, God always has to disrupt the old first. Could it be that God uh, is disrupting your traditions? God will always disrupt traditions. He will disrupt our formula. He will disrupt our associations. He, our infrastructure, what we've always been used to. God is not going to usher us into a new thing unless he first disrupts the old thing. As a matter of fact, the Bible continues to say that you cannot bring new wine into old wine skin. So if God is going to usher us into a new thing, if God wants to take us to a new place, then that means that the old has to move away so that it gives place to the new thing that God wants to do. And the truth is that God has good intent for us. 
He has a good intention for you. He has a good intention for me, regardless of what is going on in your life right now. He has a good intention for you, and that is something you have to believe. God has promised us good things. Actually, the Bible says, Jeremiah 29, 11, that I have plans for you. I have good plans for you. Plans not to bring you harm, but plans to bring you an expected end. Plans to, to give you good stuff. God is intending to bring something new and something good in your life. God does not is not the author of evil. There's no particular point in, in life that God has ever planned evil upon someone. But God wants to respond to our need. And when God looks at our lives because he created us, he did not create us to destroy us, but God created us so that he can be able to put us or to bring us to a good land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. But before he does it, there has to be something that has to proceed. God has to remove the old. God has to remove things that have been holding us back and introduce something new, a, way, a new way of living, a new way of thinking. And we have to align ourselves to what God is doing in our lives today. But it takes something for us to get there. So many times uh, when I look back into my life, there are moments that I sensed that God uh, was about to do something new. And probably in your life where you are right now, you, you could sense it, you could feel it. And maybe you're probably even praying and asking God to, to do something new in your life. You're praying for God to bring you to a new land. You're asking God to, to do certain things in your life. I do not know what they are. But what is it that God wants us to do first before we cross over to the new land, before the Israelites crossed over to, to, to Canaan? What is it that God wanted them to understand first? Because God is a promise keeper. He promised many years ago that I am going to take you to a new land, a new land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm going to give you a, a place for you to rest. But before that comes, something else has to come first. And in my life, I have come to realize and to understand that there is no particular place and there is no particular new thing that God ever did in my life without first him removing some old stuff so that I can be able to embrace the new. But many times you never anticipate. And so I want us to bring us to a book. I want us to, to read a, a story that we really seal what I'm trying to say to you today about God doing a new thing in our lives today. Despite what is going on in the world today, I strongly believe that God wants to bring or to usher something new into, into the human race. I want us to read from the book of Numbers. And this story is familiar to many of you. And this is a story about the spies. And I want to begin from uh, Numbers chapter 13. And we are going to draw some lessons from this story. What is it that could be hindering us from moving into the new thing that God is doing? Or what, 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 what is potentially, uh, what, is, what is it that could potentially risk or cause us not to experience the new thing that God wants us to do in our lives today? Numbers 13, chapter 13 from verse 1. I'm going to read and I'm going to skip a, a number of verses. I might not be able to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read uh, from Numbers chapter 13 from verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Verse 3, so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Peran according to the command of the Lord. All of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now from verse 4 all the way to around verse 15, you find the, 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 the tribes and you find the name of the men that were sent to go and spy into the land. Uh, there, there were about 12 of them in number. And then we jump over to verse 16. And these are the names of the men uh, whom Moses sent to spy out the land and Moses called Hoshea the son of Nun Joshua verse 17 then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and say to them go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak few or many whether the land they dwell in is good or bad whether the cities they inhabit are like camps of stronghold whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are forests or, or, there, or, or, there, or there are none. But be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. Verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near the entrance of Hamath. Verse 22. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahiman, Sheshal, and Talmai. And descendants of Anak were there. 
Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Verse 23, Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. Verse 25. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. After 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and the very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the river Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, This is critical, stay with me. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that divorced its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, in bracket, the descendants of Anak, came from uh, the descendants of Anak who came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, Okay, so he said, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight first. And so we were in their sight. I'm going to read a bit of, of chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Verse 4. So they say to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. For now I'm going to end there. Say, so let us select a leader and return to Egypt. I find it interesting that when God promised the Israelites about Canaan, he never told them, exactly what they were going to face. He never told them that they were going to face walls and they were going to meet giants. When you go back a bit and read the story, God told Moses, go and tell the children of Israel, I'm going to bring you from this land of Egypt and I'm going to take you to a land flowing with the milk and honey. God initially was not very specific about some of the things they were going to encounter. He never gave them a blueprint of how the, 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 the land was, was looking like. As a matter of fact, when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, God never even bothered to chase the Canaanites and the Amorites. You know, you would expect that God is calling you to a new place, to a new land, and he's going to get rid of everything that is going to come against you or anything that is going to be a hindrance for you to settle down. You know, he didn't tell them that, you know, see what you're going to do now. I want you to pick young men and train special forces. And these are the kind of weapons I want you to have. And you're going to have this kind of missiles and this kind of machine guns and machetes and all that. It is interesting that God never gave them details. But he said, you know what? I'm going to take you to a land of milk and I'm going to take you to a new place. I'm going to take you to a new land. And that is where you're going to dwell. You know, when this year began, God... Uh, gave you a promise and some of you had plans you know god had already spoken to you some of you expected much you knew you were going to launch out that business and you were going to go into a new place but you never anticipated that the economy would shut down in the middle of the year nobody expected there would be a pandemic in the whole universe in the whole world i mean sorry nobody thought about the uncertainty of a time like this and yet god had promised us 
I remember when the new year began, I have a tradition to move to a place where I take my family and watch the fireworks. And, you know, you go back home and you look at your notebook and you write out all the things that you want to do. And, you uh, and, and you know, you, you confess the promises of God. You have a plan in place. You know what you're going to do. You, 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 you have already, you have witnessed in your heart that this is the new thing that God is going to do this year. By the end of this year, 31st December, we'll have accomplished this and that. But nobody anticipated the children of Israel never anticipated any moment that the, the giants would be there. They never anticipated the walls. They never anticipated that the Amorites would be there. But God had promised them. He had promised them to do a new thing in their life after many years in captivity in Egypt. They had a promise of God. They, 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 were, they, 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 they had prophecies come to them and they had seen a, a savior. God had sent Moses as a savior to them, but they never anticipated. What is it that God wants to do in your life? Because right now many people have different kind of questions. A lot of people are wondering, how could it be? How, how, how would this come about? And as I said earlier, this is just not about coronavirus. People are going through many other challenges in life. And you had a promise from God. There is something that God wants to do in your life. You are on your track. You are moving in the right direction. And something has happened. Something happened in your life. God wants us to move with him and he wants us to embrace the new thing that he's doing in our lives. But many times we never get to the promised land. You know what? The children of Israel, and I'm going to come to that later, and they had to go back into the wilderness and they stayed there for many years until that whole generation passed on. But I'm running ahead of myself. I'm going to come there. But God wants us to move, wants to move us to a new place. He wants us to move. To, uh, he wants to move us to a land flowing with milk and honey. He has promised us He's going to do it. But many times, we really never get to see that land, or we are delayed in getting to the place that God wants us to get to, because many times we are not ready for it. Many times we are not prepared. We don't have. Uh, we have not pulled down. We have not uh, pulled down the old stuff, and we have not built enough capacity to experience the new thing that God is going to do in our lives, that or that God wants to do in our lives. So, what is it that God has promised? What is it that God wants us to do? And how exactly are we supposed to equip ourselves to experience? The new thing that God wants to do in our lives. How do we equip ourselves? How do we prepare ourselves? What is it that God wants us to do in this silent moment? I'm calling it a silent moment. What is it that God wants us to do right now so that we can be able to cross over into the new thing that he is doing? And when I read this story, there are a couple of lessons that I've drawn there. And if God is really going to change your life, and if God is going to move you from where you are, and if you really believe God has a good plan for you, and you've already seen that plan, you've seen the land, you want to go into the new, the first thing you need to understand is that you have to demonstrate courage and eliminate doubt and fear. Let me repeat that again. You have to demonstrate courage and eliminate doubt and fear. Let me tell you what courage is. Courage is the quality of mindset or state of mind or spirit that compels people to face situation in spite of fear, to face different situations in spite of fear. I'm not saying that I don't get afraid. Everybody gets afraid. Every one of us gets shaken once in a while. I've been through some season this time and I was a bit shaken. I was afraid. I was afraid for my life. I was afraid for my health. And many times we are afraid because of various things. When we encounter trouble, we are afraid. So I, I, I'm, I'm really looking at the children of Israel and I'm saying to myself, I may not entirely blame them, but I can understand from where they were coming from and where they are. It was possible that they greatly feared after the report came. But what is God saying? Despite everything that surrounds us, what is God saying? That we have to demonstrate courage and eliminate doubt and fear. Listen, the spies of Israel saw the land. They saw the milk, they saw the honey, they saw the fig trees, they saw the grapes, they saw every good thing. I mean, uh, the, the spies brought in a lot of evidence to prove that truly the land that God had promised, is, promised them was good. And I know in your life you've seen, you, you, you have evidence, you've seen what God wants to do in your life. But many times, you know what happens? The devil comes in and puts fear and doubt in your mind. And the moment the devil plans that, because every time God wants to do something new, definitely some things are going to be shaken. Your life is not going to remain the same. Circumstances may change. But what the enemy does, he brings a seed of doubt and fear in your life. Because he doesn't want you to cross over. He doesn't want you to, uh, uh, to, to receive the new thing that God is doing. So what he's good at is he comes and plants something in your mind. You see, doubt and fear caused a whole generation to be wiped away. When the spies came back, it was only Caleb and Joshua who said that we can take the land. The rest of the spies 
after showcasing everything they had brought. Can you imagine that? Here are the fig trees, here are, are the grapes, here are the vegetables, here is all the manner of fruits and everything that they brought from their spy mission. And yet, after seeing everything that God had prepared, they doubted. And they allowed fear to enter their lives. And worse still, they put that fear in the people. In our local dialect to say, Wali Sambaza. They put fear in the people. And so they caused a whole generation to doubt. Later on, if you read that whole story, God later got angry and said, everyone who is below 20, everyone above 20 years henceforth, who doubted God and who, 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 who spoke ill of Moses and who spoke ill of God will not leave the desert, but they died in the desert. Can you imagine how dangerous doubt and fear could be that you can call, cause a whole generation to be wiped away or to face calamity because we doubt and fear what God is about to do? To live into the future means to leap into the unknown. And this requires a lot of courage. To live into the future means to leap into the unknown. Most of, this, most of the Israelites, after they received the message, had a lot of zeal when they left Egypt. But the moment this bad report came, the moment fear and doubt crept into their mind, they were, unable, they were not able to have the courage to leap into the unknown. Because fear and doubt crept into their heart. What is it that God has told you he's going to do in your life? And probably the enemy has come and sowed fear and doubt in your heart. And all of a sudden, probably you believe you cannot be able to achieve what God has called you to do. 2 Timothy 1 says, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 is one of my best scriptures says, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Why a sound mind? Because everything that happens or is bound to happen in your life begins in your mind. And I'm going to come to that. Begins in your mind. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Stay with me. I'm going to speak about, I'm going to speak about the mind when I come to the next other point. So courage must be demonstrated. You have to be able to demonstrate courage, eliminate doubt and fear, if you are really going to embrace the new thing that God is about to do in your life. Forget about everything else that is happening. Don't be so moved about what is going on in the world right now. But I want you to have a spirit of courage and do everything that you can to eliminate doubt and fear. If you're going to embrace the new thing that God is doing secondly, and if you're going to really experience the miracle of God in your life or receive what God has prepared for you in this season, you have to be willing to embrace change. You have to be willing to embrace change. Change is not something we should resist. It's something we should get excited about but you know what? Many people don't like change. People don't like change because change is uncomfortable. Many times change is uncomfortable. We don't like change. We like to live in our traditions. We like to do things the way we've always done it. You know, this is how we do things. This is how we do things in our family. This is how we do things in our country. This is how we do things in this government. This is how we roll. But you see, you cannot be able to move into the new unless you're willing to embrace some change in your life. The Israelites feared change. Why? Because they were accustomed to Egypt. They were accustomed to Egypt. As much as Egypt was so uh, demoralizing, Egypt was a place of pain. Egypt was a place, uh, I mean, they would wake up, they were being whipped. They, they were task, I mean, their taskmasters put a lot of burden on them and their lives. I mean, they were slaves for many, many years. But interestingly, this is something that had not yet left their mind. They were not willing to change to the new thing that God was doing. Despite every miracle, despite everything they saw on their way from Egypt into the wilderness, they were not truly, truly willing to embrace change. You know, for some of us, are you accustomed to friends? Are you accustomed to... Probably you have been so much accustomed to hanging out with people and being in public places. You've been so busy that now change has come and you are uncomfortable with it. You know, for some of us, solitude is, is, is a new dictionary word. You do not know what solitude means. Probably God brought this because he wants to bring something new in life. And so what did he do? He has to ensure that you have to have a place of solitude. So probably you can, you can sit down and think and analyze your life and ask yourself questions. Where are you coming from? Where are you right now? Where are you going? You have to be willing to embrace change. Unfortunately, the children of Israel, while they were in the desert, even after the report came that the land they were going into 
was full of milk and honey and all the pleasantries. They were not willing and ready to embrace the change. Some of us were so accustomed to our places of worship that unless people congregate, you cannot go to church, you cannot worship God. So now he's changed. All of us are at home. Could this be the change that is going to drive you to the place of personal prayer and meditation for yourself? Probably this change came so that you can spend more time with your family. You know, everyone is looking at the negative side of whatever is going on around the globe, but I'm looking at it as a moment of change. As a moment of change. And I believe to some level that God allowed this to happen so that you can begin to embrace change. Because unless we embrace change, we are not going to experience the new thing that God wants to do in our lives. So what is it that God is asking you to change in your life today? God wanted the children of Israel to allow themselves to know that, hey, we are in a new place. We are in a new season. Change is coming. But change doesn't come easy. Because many times when change comes, it causes us to be uncomfortable. We don't like to lose friends that have been inspiring us in the wrong way. We don't want to lose our, our networks. We don't want to lose, you know, uh, our way of life. We don't want to, to lose the, 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 the times we, we've been parting out, you know. There's a new thing in town where there's a new thing that came around and people are so accustomed to party after party after party and all these things that we do with our friends. Everywhere we hang out, we don't have time for family. We don't have time uh, to, to think about our lives. We don't have time to revisit our vision and our dreams and ask ourselves we've been able to achieve what we want to achieve. And now we are forced in a season and a moment where definitely change is coming and change has come. We are not living the way we are accustomed to. The Israelites feared change. Could be in Egypt was better for some of them because they were, they were given rations of food. They were in a place where, I mean, they, they had a hard day. I mean, they were being whipped all over the place. But then you know what? At the end of the day, there's a meal on your table because the taskmasters would give them food and give them a place to sleep. But now you're in the wilderness. You don't have a comfortable home. You don't have a, a place to, to sit and relax. But it just surprises me that they would even think of going back to Egypt to what they were accustomed to. Why? Because they feared change. And yet God had promised them something so awesome. New things require us to change so that we can be able to achieve new results. You can never achieve something new. You can never get new results if you are not willing to change probably your attitude, the way you do things. Nothing new comes from an old mindset. So you have to be ready and willing to embrace change in your life. If God is going to do something new in your life, you have to be willing and you have to be ready to embrace change. The other thing I want to share with you today is that if you really want to experience a new thing, if you want to experience what God is doing in your life today, if you want to experience what God is about to do in your life, if you want to cross over and get to Canaan, if you want to see the goodness of the Lord in your life, in whatever you are dreaming, in whatever your vision could be, whatever you are trusting God for in this season, you have to have a paradigm shift. Your mind has to change. Friends, your mind has to change. I like what Caleb said. This is what Caleb said. We have seen the chariots and the giants, but we can take up the land. He said, we can take up the land. Let us go up and take the land. You see, uh, Caleb saw everything that I would probably look at in a, in a difficult situation and turn back. But you see, Caleb and Joshua, despite everything that was happening in the wilderness, despite the trials and the challenges they had faced, God had allowed them to come to a place where their minds had already conceived and they could see what God was about to do. They had learned their lessons from experiences in the past all the way when they were crossing from, from Egypt to the, to the Red Sea and to in the wilderness and the time they had spent in the wilderness, their minds had shifted. You can never go beyond your thinking. You see, the spies went and looked at him. Some of these spies came and said, you know what? We looked at these people, the giants, and we, 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 we seemed like grasshoppers in their midst. Uh, and it says that we looked at ourselves and we were like grasshoppers. In our own sight, we were like grasshoppers. And in their sight, we were like grasshoppers. So who told them that they were, they were like grasshoppers? What gave them that idea? Where did they get this idea from? You see, Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let me tell you, your mind your thoughts, what you think is what shapes your life. What you think is what shapes your life. What shapes your thinking then? Is it people's opinions? Is it the social media? Is it Hollywood or Nollywood? What is it that shapes your mind? What is it that really shapes your mind? Because 
who you are today is as a result of what has continually, continually gotten into your mind. If God is going to move into your life and if you're going to experience the new, you have to shift your mindset. You have to have what I call a paradigm shift. So what is your source of information? What are you reading today? What do you listen to? You know, I won't mention the name of the radio station, but in the city of Nairobi, you have very many radio stations. And every time, sometimes when I'm riding the, the public transport, it amazes me that almost every public transport vehicle tunes in to a particular channel, which I do not, which I'm not going to mention. And I, I don't believe in the content that comes from that radio station because it is content that doesn't build. It is worked up content. It is content that has been that has been cooked up somewhere. And it is just brought for, for listeners to just listen and tickle their ear because they're trying to get a following. So this is not content that can build people's lives. And what I have done many times, if I'm do, uh, riding public transport, what I do, I'll carry my earphones and I'll get a book to read and I'll just disconnect because I understand something that whatever gets into your mind remains into your subconscious mind. And later it begins, you begin to have a replay of whatever you are listening that entire day, whatever you read, whatever you watch, whatever you allow to get into your mind, that is what shapes your mind. That is what shapes your paradigm. And eventually, the value and the quality of your mind develops from what you listen, from what you see, from what people tell you, from whatever your source could be. Some of you probably you're interested in the tablets. Everything you're reading is from the tablets, the rumors, the, 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 the Hollywood things and all the things that are happening in the world. You never really get time to, to probably look at the Bible and look at some of the wisdom that is trapped there. And not just the Bible alone. There are great men who have written very good books about life, about business, about relationships. But do you take time to source from the right uh, place? So how do you move from the old to the new if your mindset still remains in yesterday's? It remains in yesterday's thinking. I believe strongly that one of the things that made God cause the children of Israel to remain in the wilderness for such a long time is because their mindsets and the way they thought and the way they think and the way they perceived God in life wasn't changed. And unfortunately, a whole generation was wiped out because they couldn't perceive the new. They couldn't allow themselves for their minds to change. We can't change the world with yesterday's thinking. Right now, the world is facing a lot of trouble. Right now, there are so many challenges in the world. There are so many things. We have global warming uh, you know, affecting the world. We have a lot of uh, economical problems. We have uh, people who are migrating from this nation to this nation because of war, because of all manner of calamity. And the world is in dire need of solutions, but we cannot provide solutions to the world with yesterday's thinking. You know, someone said, today's excellence is tomorrow's mediocrity, and I believe that. Some of the things that shook the world 20, 50 years ago are not some of the things that will shake the world today. Some of the ideas that played well to solving problems in the world yesterday are not the same things that are going to change the world today. God is futuristic, and so should we be. We have always to come to the place of tapping into God's mindset and asking ourselves, what is it that God wants me to do in this season? Because I want to go into the new thing he's doing. What is it about my mind that I have to change? So you might probably begin to look at your library at home. Probably you need to begin to change the books that you're reading. Probably for some of you, you need to begin to, you need to, begin to change the programs you're watching. Because every content, whatever content you allow into your mind, goes into your heart and into your spirit and into your inner man. And that is what shapes you. We need people with a transformed mindset that can tap into God's wisdom and create solutions for this world. I told you earlier, Proverbs 23 verse 7 says that a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How is your mind, people? How, how, how do you think? How do you live? Because your life is shaped by what is in your mind. And the enemy knows that. So even as we move on to begin to embrace what God wants to do and to begin to, to, to ask ourselves what kind of, of life do we want to live? How do we want to live? Where do we want to go? We must understand that our mindset has to change. We have to change our paradigm. We have to have a paradigm shift. You know, sometimes I hear people talk about Africa and Europe and I hear people say, you know, uh, because I'm an African, I believe that Africa, Africans, we are blessed. We have, a great, we have great resources. 
But for many years, I've always wondered and asked myself that Africa being the richest continent with all these resources we have, why is it that in certain places we have remained behind? Could it be that this is the season that God is calling us to begin to shift our mind, begin to shift our mindset and begin to come up with solutions that are going to change our government, to change our economy, to change the way we live and stop dependence on other foreign countries? Look at ourselves and ask ourselves, where is our solution? Of course, I believe in God. He's, he is the, the solution giver. But even as God, God says that if we have to have wisdom, we have to go and seek and, and search his word so that we can be able to draw out that wisdom. And I believe if there is anything that is going to change our continent today, are people who are committed to change their mindsets and to change their paradigms and to truly seek the word of God and ask God, we need solution for our country. We need solution for our nation. We need a solution for, for our families. We need a solution. Because these kind of solutions are not going to come from the world. They're going to come from the word of God. And I believe that God has blessed us with tremendous wisdom in his word. You know, Solomon asked God and God asked him, what do you want me to give? And Solomon said, I want you to give me wisdom. Solomon never asked for money. He never asked for gold. He never asked for precious stones. He said, God, I want you to give me wisdom. And we can read about all that Solomon wrote and all the solutions that he came up with. And Many thousands of years later, we are reading at what he wrote and some of the things said and most of the things that he said, we are applying them into our lives. Because one man stood out and said, God, I want to change my mind. I want to change the way I'm thinking. I want a paradigm shift. So if God is going to do a new thing in your life, you have to be intentional and you have to determine to change your mindset. Fourthly, if you want to experience something new, if you want to see the new land, if you want to experience the goodness of the new thing that God is doing, we have to determine and take the right approach. We have to determine and to take the right approach. What is the right approach? The right approach to me is faith and action. You know, Caleb said in, in, in chapter 13, verse 30, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Now that takes faith. How do you go to a foreign land? You are living in the wilderness. You move in and you spy in on a new land and you see all this fortification. You see all these armies, all these chariots, and you see all these tribes and you see all these giants and you see everything that these people have done to fortify their cities. I mean, when I'm reading this chapter, I'm seeing there were people who are living in the mountains. There are Canaanites who are living in the, uh, on the shoreline and there were people who are living in the valleys. And this, this was a country that was filled with all manner of people. And the Bible says that there were giants in the land. And then you come back and say, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. That is faith. You know, somebody said that faith moves mountains. But you see, faith without action, that, that's something different. It's one thing to have faith, but it's another thing for you to take action and to believe that God is actually going to grant you what you're believing in. Faith is the fuel that causes us to move into ancient territory, into territory that has never been stepped up before, into territory that no one else has gone before. You know, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, For now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for. So the children of Israel had this hope and they had this belief. As much as many of them never saw the land, but Caleb and Joshua and the rest of the people who believed in God had tremendous faith. You see, God requires faith. But at the same time, it is our responsibility to act upon that faith and take a step of faith. It is interesting that God showed them the land, but God was not going to come down and hold their hand and tell them, here I am, let's go. He was there. His presence was there. All the way from Egypt, the Bible says that he, he rode with them. There was a pillar of fire at night. There was a cloud during the daytime. And the angels of God were straight right ahead of them and behind them. But the point at the point when God required them to take over the land, it had to take a measure of action. It had to make. It had to take a, a measure of some action for them to possess the land. I know you have faith, and sometimes I say, you know, prayer alone is not everything. There are sometimes that God, all that God requires for you is to pray. Yes, there are those seasons, there are those times that all you can do is to pray, and wait for the miraculous. But I believe there are some times when we pray and take some action, because faith follows action. God has given us every ability. God has given us every gift. 
God is backing us up. The Bible says in Psalms, Psalms chapter 91 that God is going to command his angels to watch over us in every way, in all our ways. So whatever path you have chosen to take, God is with you. But prayer alone is not going to do it. The right approach for me is that you've got to have faith. You've got to believe that God is able to do the impossible. You know, many times you have these dreams and we write them down. And the beginning of the year is a time that you come and you write everything that you want to achieve, everything that you're expecting God to do for us. And you write it down, we put it on pen and paper and we believe it. And many times when some little trouble comes, when our boat is shaken, we lose our faith. And it is normal sometimes to lose faith. It is okay. Sometimes we lose faith. Sometimes we lose faith. And sometimes it takes a lot of courage to just have faith to move into the to unknown territory. But you know what? Someone said, if I can't remember uh, some, some, I don't know who, who said this, but I read it somewhere, that no man unwilling to discover new, uh, no man unwilling to lose sight of the show will discover new lines. No man unwilling to lose sight of the show will discover new lines. You know, in the olden times when people like Vasco da Gama and all the other sailors and all the other, all, all the other, um, scientists and all those great men who went to discover new lands you know it, it is one thing to get into a boat and leave the shore and begin to to move uh, to un undiscovered territory it is one thing to get into the boat but it is another thing to lose sight of where you are coming from it takes faith it takes faith to say you know what i believe god has said it i believe god wants to do it but i am willing to lose sight of the shore and to discover new lands because I believe in God. Because I believe that God is with me. And I believe that he's holding me with his right hand and he's going to lead me. So the right approach. You have to determine to take the right approach. And the right approach, the best right approach that I can give you today is that you have to go to the place of faith. Many of us lose faith when calamity strikes. Many of us have lost our faith right now. There's a pandemic right now that is hitting our country, that is hitting, hitting the entire world. And a lot of people have drawn back. And they have begun to believe theories and things that people are speaking. Let me tell you, brother and sister, my friend, you're watching and you're listening to me. Stay at the place of faith. If you're trusting God to do something new in your life, stay at the place of faith. It doesn't matter whether the boat is being rocked. It doesn't matter whether it is raining or not raining. Stay at the place of faith. Plan for some action. Plan for some action. It is interesting that many times we have faith. But when the, the boat is rocked a bit, we began with faith. But many times when the boat is rocked and we look like we are sinking, we lose our faith and we cast our faith away and we begin to believe in other things. We begin to believe in the money we have in the bank. We begin to believe in our relatives. We begin to, to believe in our politicians. We begin to believe in, 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 our, in the resources we have. But I want to encourage you today that God is about to do something in your life. God is about to cause us to cross over to the promised land. But we have to have faith. And with that faith, we have to be ready to take some action. So there are four things that I've spoken to us today. And I've said that first we have to demonstrate courage. And eliminate doubt and fear. You cannot achieve anything if you still have doubt and fear in your heart. It is okay sometimes we fear. It is okay sometimes we have doubt. But God has not called us to a place of fear. God has called us to a place of power, to a place of sound mind, to a place of believing in him that is able to do it and he will accomplish everything that he's promised in our life. We have to be ready to embrace change. You have to be able to embrace change. Embrace change. Make change your lover. You have to be able to embrace change. God will never bring something new unless first he removes the old. We have to embrace the new. If God is going to do something new in our life, if you have to step over to the promised land, we have to embrace change. This is a new season. This is a good place for you to begin to ask yourself, what is it that God is asking me to change about my life? Is God asking you to change some things about your habits? Are, are there some, some, some change of habit that God wants you to, to undertake right now? Probably form new habits. Form some new habits. And then thirdly, I've said that we have to have a paradigm shift. You've got to change the way you think. You've got to begin to, to change where you're getting your information from. What are you reading? Whom are you listening to? You know, some of us listen to everything that comes in your radio waves. You listen to everything that comes. I mean, you don't have to pick every phone call. You don't have to read every email. You don't have to, to be in every WhatsApp group. Because whatever you allow to come into your mind is what shapes your life. As a man thinketh, so is he. 
And the way you think is, caused, is, is, is brought about by what you've been consuming. So what are you consuming today? So for you to have a paradigm shift, you've got to change your intake. You've got to change your diet. And then finally, you have to determine to take the right approach. And the right approach is you've got to build your faith. Surround yourself with people who have faith. Surround yourself with, with content that builds your faith. So that when you take action, so that when you take the action, and whatever action you're planning to take, whatever action God causes you to take, you take it in a place of faith, not from a place of fear and intimidation. I want to pray for you today as I finish my sermon today. And I am uh, completely believing, I am totally believing that God is about to do something new in our country. He's about to do something new in the world. He's about to do something new in our families. He's about to do something new in your business. He's about to do something new in your personal life, in your relationships. God is about to cause you to cross over to a place of new land. God is about to cause you to cross over to the promised land. I know there are so many things that are happening right now. Your finances could not be right. Probably you began this year by, by, by putting down some investment and saying, you know what, God, I'm putting down this investment. I'm putting down this amount of money or these resources because I want to build some, some business. I want to build some enterprise. And right now, everything that is happening seems like you're not going to achieve what you planned. You're not going to see the, the, the fruit of everything that you believed God for. I don't want you to, to give up. Don't lose hope yet. Don't lose hope yet. There is always light in the darkness. Could it be that this is the best opportunity that could have ever happened in your life? For some of you, you are just about to invest, including myself. I was about to take some resources and put them somewhere. Now I thank God because this situation that came, if I would have put my money and invested my resources in whatever enterprise I was planning to do, I would have lost. So could it be that this is an opportunity? Yes, on the outside, we can see giants. On the outside, we can see fortification of cities. This land that we are about to go into looks like it's impossible. You know, the children of Israel looked into it and they thought that this is impossible. We cannot take this land. But I want to have an attitude. And I want, to have the, I want us to have the mindset that was in Caleb and Joshua and say, we can go up and take this land. We can embrace God's gift at this time. Solitude is a good thing. It causes us to think. It causes us to, to, to shift from where we are and to begin to see possibilities even in the place of adversity. So I do not know what you're going through right now today, but I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to believe with you and I'm going to pray for you and I'm here to believe that whatever could be going on in your life is just a setup. It's just something that God is going to use as a stepping stone into a new place in life, into a new thing. So are we ready for that change? Are we ready to change the way we think? Are we ready to go to the place of faith and the place of prayer once again and ask God, Lord, change my mind, change my mindset, change the way I think. Give me new friends. Give me new associations. You know, right now we, we cannot really meet the way we have been meeting and socializing. Could it be that this is a setup for, for God to bring in some new friends, some friends that will add value and quality in your life? I want to submit to you today that there is always light, some light in the darkness. Everything that is happening today, I believe strongly, it is going to work for your good. It is going to work for my good. And I want to pray for you right now. And as we end this uh, sermon today, to believe that the next time we meet, we're going to hear testimonies. We're going to hear what God has done in your life. We're going to celebrate with you as you cross over to the new place that God has for you, to the glory and honor of his name. In Jesus' name. So right now, wherever you are, bow down your head and I would like to pray for you. A prayer of faith. And going to join our hands together wherever you are. If you're sitting in the sitting room, if you're at your workplace, you probably you're, you're seated somewhere, you're alone. If you're with your friends or family. I know right now, uh, I'm sorry, we cannot hold hands really, but we can keep our social distance, yes. But we, we, can, we can agree in faith. It doesn't matter whether we hold hands or not. Whatever prayer we make of faith, God is going to listen to us and God is going to hear us. And I believe that God is willing, able, to answer our prayer and to cause us to see the new thing that is doing in our life. Let's pray. Everlasting Father, I want to thank you for this special moment that you have given us to share with your people. Your people could be going through uh, various things. We are all going through a trying season, a trying time. But I believe that in this darkness, in what looks like darkness, there is light that is coming at the end of the tunnel. 
I want to prophesy to a business person wherever you are that God is going to do a new thing. God is going to give you new associations. And I pray that you give your people peace. And I pray that the Spirit of God will move in our lives like we've never seen before. That during these times of solitude, during these times when we are locked down, during this time that we are in our houses, some of us cannot travel back home and be with our families, that God, you're going to take this time to speak to us. Spirit of God, move in our homes, move in our families, move in our workplaces, wherever we are watching from. Holy Ghost, I pray that you touch each and every person who is listening or watching to me right now. And I pray that, Father, let the spirit of fear be defeated today in the name of Jesus. For the Bible says that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Today we determine, Father, to change our mindsets. We determine to, to just seek uh, for you and look into your word and understand the times and the season that you are living in. That these times and seasons we are living are not times and seasons that are, are, are meant for evil, but they are meant for good. It is for the good of us, oh God. It is for the good of the world. It is for the good of our families. It is for the good of our businesses. We trust in you, Father. And right now, Father, I pray for every father. I pray for every mother. I pray for every son. I pray for every daughter, every uncle, every child, every boy, every girl. That, Father God, you may touch us. And I also pray right now, God, that you may protect your people. Protect us, oh God, from this pandemic. Protect your children. Protect our country. Protect, Father, our continent. Protect us, oh God. I pray that, Father God, you may even give us a solution for whatever is going on. Even we could take measures, oh God. We could quarantine. We could stay at home. But, Father, victory comes from you, Father. Restoration comes from you. Father, restore your people. Heal your people to the glory and honor of your name. Before I log out or before I go, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you if you are there and you are not born again, you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you don't have a relationship. Salvation is about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not about joining this denomination or that denomination. It's about having a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I would like you to say this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. I repent all my sins. I ask you to forgive me. Jesus let your blood wash and cleanse me. I receive the gift of salvation today. I am forgiven. And with my mouth, I confess and I profess that I'm a new creature to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name, I pray and believe. If you've made this prayer, kindly write to us. Let us know about your experience. Tell us how you feel. Let us, you know, let us hear your testimony. All our social media platforms are open. You can write to us on email, on Instagram, or connect with us on Facebook, and we will respond to you. I trust and believe, God, that the, uh, the, the coming week will be fruitful, and it will be full of joy, it will be full of strength, and God is going to do a new thing in your life. And until we meet next time, on behalf of the Waterbrook Church, on behalf of Reverend Peter Dara, our senior pastor, I would like to thank you for taking the moment and the time to listen or view this broadcast. May God bless you. See you next Sunday.